So now we're going to look at the geometry of these molecules, the geometry of the polarity of these molecules, whether they are polar or nonpolar molecules. Polar or nonpolar um, is the property that lets us identify what things will dissolve in other liquids. So our vinegar and um, salad dressing, vinegar and olive oil, do not stay blended together. They will separate out because the vinegar is polar and the olive oil is non-polar. So we have um, a three-layer process, and usually we get through the first two layers and not to the third layer. The first layer is geometry of the molecule, the shape of the molecule. If the molecule is highly symmetric. It's going to be nonpolar. We don't want to even look at the electronegativities because they don't help us. The shape of the molecule determines whether it's polar or nonpolar. If that is not sufficient, then the next level would be formal charge. See if it's a charge separation that can create a polarity. And then if that doesn't work, then we can look at our uh, electronegativities. So on this um, xenon tetrabromide, we have a square planar based from an octahedral electron geometry. Our square planar is a highly symmetric molecule. So we can see that each atom is balanced by an opposite atom, directly opposite. So each atom, as long as they're identical atoms, are pulling in against each other. So what we're looking for is that the atoms attached to the central atoms are identical and that it's highly symmetric. And highly symmetric usually means that there's no lone pairs on the central atom. But we have two of these that will create a um, highly symmetric molecule with lone pairs on them. So the, whenever we have the electron geometry matching the molecular geometry and all the attached atoms are identical, we're going to have a highly symmetric molecule. So that's these molecules on the left side. We have two of them that are also highly symmetrical, even though they do have lone pairs. And that will include our square planar here. All the atoms are balanced against each other, and the lone pairs are balanced against each other. And the linear from the trigonal bipyramidal. So the atoms are against each other and the three lone pairs forming an equilateral triangle also balance each other out. So these are highly symmetric and these are highly symmetric. So when the attached atoms are identical, we'll have a nonpolar molecule. If the attached atoms are different, then we'll, we'll generally have a polar molecule or if we have one of these other geometries that are not highly symmetric, these will be polar molecules also. So this square planar with the four bromides attached, this is highly symmetric. So this is going to be nonpolar. The triiodide molecule, well, we should check our formal charge before we declare that one. It looks linear. Well, we know it's going to be because it's the uh, highly symmetric linear coming from trigonal bipyramidal. But we should check formal charge anyway. So we have, uh, we're going to have a negative one somewhere. The side atoms, we have seven valence electrons minus six dots minus one dash gives us zero. The central one, seven valence electrons minus six dots minus two dashes, that's our negative one. So the negative one is in the center, the two sides are, are balanced, so this molecule is highly symmetric with the attached atoms on the side being identical, and this is nonpolar. Our formaldehyde, Trigonal planar, so we have the um, electron geometry matching the electron geometry, no lone pairs on the carbon, but the attached atoms are not the same. So this one we expect to be polar. 
the phosphorus pentafluoride. We have uh, our electron and electric geometry being the same. There's no lone pairs on the phosphorus. All the attached atoms are identical. So this is going to be nonpolar. Let's do a couple more. The sulfur trioxide. We have three identical oxygens attached to the sulfur. We have no lone pairs on sulfur. Our electron and electron geometry is the same. So this is a nonpolar molecule. And it's nonpolar, even though the electronegative difference between sulfur and oxygen is significant. We have a very polar bond, but it's very highly symmetric, which makes it nonpolar. The POCl3, we have our tetrahedral structure, electron vector geometry is the same. Oh, but the attached atoms are not the same. So that will make it polar. For oxygen, we have our difference in trigonal uh, between our uh, trigonal planar electron geometry and molecular bent geometry. But the attached atoms, all the atoms are the same, but there is a lone pair in the central atom. But if we look at the formal charge on this, we see that on the bent molecule here, the bottom is negative. It's going to oscillate between the left and right, but the bottom is negative and the top is always positive. So we're going to have a dipole on this, pointing toward the negative side, coming from the positive side. So even though we have three identical atoms, no electronegativity difference, we do have a polar molecule for ozone. For carbon dioxide, the attached atoms are the same. Electron and electric geometries are the same, no lone pairs on the carbon. So even though we have a very polar bond, they balance each other out. Highly symmetric molecule, so this becomes a non-polar molecule. 